the Honourable Member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's always better to follow the member from Winnipeg Centre because then everybody on the other side of the house is awake. And I really appreciate that. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I get nervous. I, I get nervous when, um, when I uh, read about free trade deals with countries like Panama. I come from a labour background, from working for trade unions, and I know that when we reach agreements with other countries that have very poor labour relations records, that have very low wages generally, that Canadians suffer. Canadian workers suffer, unionized or not, because we are now competing for the bottom. We are now trying to enter into a race to the bottom. And that nervousness is part of what drives me to want to speak to this motion. Because this agreement with Panama does not uh, correct the very shoddy state of the labor relations in Panama. We are not dealing with a country on an even footing. And I appreciate my uh, friend from Winnipeg Centre's comments about we don't always want to be on an even footing. We want to have agreements with countries regardless of whether or not they are their e our equals, because we hope that our uh, entering into these agreements will raise everyone's standard of living in both countries. But the experience that we've had, the experience that I personally have had, is that when there is a low-wage jurisdiction to send jobs to and there is nothing to prevent the products or services that come from that low-wage jurisdiction, that Canadian corporations, even big multinational corporations based in Canada, are quick to send those jobs elsewhere, to send those jobs to those other countries, thus hurting Canadian workers. Even in knowledge-based industries, even in film and television production, even in uh, the, the newspaper business, we have seen jobs move out of Canada into low-wage jurisdictions like Panama because there is nothing this government has done to try and prevent it. There is no barrier whatsoever. And we are now, with this bill, creating even fewer barriers to a low-wage jurisdiction and to a, a jurisdiction that has very little, if any, labor protections for, for organized labor in, it, in that country. In addition, Mr. Speaker, I get really nervous when we, we spent, I've, I've forgotten how long now, but quite a bit of time debating C-10, which had in it some raising of the bar, if you will, for persons who are uh, involved in drug activities, in fact, in drug trafficking, with a mandatory minimum five-year sentence for persons in drug trafficking, even if that person is growing as few as six pot plants to alleviate their symptoms from multiple sclerosis, they might go to jail for five years. I guess the good news in that case is they won't stay in jail for five years because they'll more than likely be dead before that's done. But the problem is we are about to enter in an agreement with a country with a large part of its economic basis being the drug trade. So how is it that we are opposed to the drug trade when it's here in Canada, but we are in favor of entering into a deal with a country where probably billions of dollars, because there's no way of disclosing how much, is being laundered from the drug trade in that country. That gives me pause, and it should give everyone here pause, that we should not be encouraging deals with drug dealers. That's just not on as far as this side of the House is concerned. There is no agreement on tax information exchange, so we don't even know the size of the problem. Both the Conservatives and the Liberals have agreed that the, uh, the, the tax doubling uh, 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 agreement is enough. It isn't enough. It doesn't disclose any of the illegal income that's floating around in that country as a tax haven, and a tax haven for drug dealers and drug cartels. The, um, we believe that uh, most of this income is from money laundering, money laundering that can't happen here in Canada because we have a good 
financial regime that, and a good taxation regime that prevents it. But now we're going to get into a bed with a country that, that permits it, that permits it and won't even disclose it. And the OECD had them on their gray list as one of the countries to not do business with, yet we are about to do business with them. <clears throat> we um, also, in my writing, there's too many drug dealers already. And what kind of a message does this send to those people who are doing harm to our community and harm to our citizens when we are entering into an agreement with a country that is notorious around the world for its being a haven for money laundering for drug deals? I'm, I'm sure there are a few Panamanians in my, in my writing, not very many, but there are probably far more drug dealers in my writing. Last summer, we had the uh, task force on anti-violence and, uh, and drugs in the riding from the police. The police showered our riding with, with uh, many more police officers over the course of the summer to try and weed out some of that drug problem. And, and yet, we're here saying it's okay to do business with what essentially is a country that harbors and is a haven for the drug trade. That doesn't make sense to me, and it shouldn't make sense to my uh, constituents either. Last week, for example, I had a meeting in the in the riding with a bunch of youth, the youth York Youth Coalition, and one of the um, the young folks that was there asked me what he should tell the kids in the riding who can't get jobs because over the course of the past uh, few years of trade deals, all the manufacturing jobs have left the riding. They've gone to other places. They've gone to the U.S. They've gone to, uh, to low-wage countries as a result in part of free trade deals that this government has signed with other countries. So these kids who can't get jobs, or if they do get a job, it's for 20 hours a week at $9 or $10 an hour, but they discover very quickly that they can earn three or $400 an hour uh, in an hour standing on a street corner selling drugs. And so the question that was asked of me is, what do I tell these kids? I, of course I tell them it's wrong to sell drugs. But what do I tell them about how they can, how, how they can move forward in society, how they can expect to actually at some point have a living, have a, a living that will sustain a family when there are no jobs, when the jobs have disappeared, as it, with my friend uh, in Winnipeg Center's writing, who, who had a huge and burgeoning uh, textile business, businesses in his writing, we used to have a long litany of manufacturing, of part, part of Ontario manufacturing, to the point where every June, the manufacturers would go line up in the high schools to solicit the kids come, graduating to come and work in their factories. The last time that happened was probably 30 years ago. And we don't even, you know, stores like Walmart certainly don't line up in the, in the high schools looking for kids. The kids come pounding on those doors looking for those $10 an hour jobs. It's a very desperate situation where I am. And we have only ourselves to blame as a result of some of these trade deals. Now, I'm not saying that we as an opposition are opposed to anything to do with trade. That's not the case. But we need to protect our interests. We need to protect the interests of Canadians in the deals that we do exercise with these other countries. We need to protect the labor rights in those countries. We need to make sure that we're not in a huge race to the bottom, in a race in which our minimum wage will never go up because we're now competing with minimum wages of a dollar an hour or a dollar a day, depending on the jurisdiction that we're about to compete with. Those are the kinds of things, and there's, and there's no protection for labor unions in those, same, in those same countries. So we need to make sure that when we enter into these agreements, and we've made proposals in the past to amend these agreements to protect the labor rights of Canadians, to protect environmental rights, and they've been rejected by both the Conservatives and the Liberals. And we believe those kinds of applications of sensible changes need to be made to this kind of agreement before it's entered into. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.